Okay, well, I think we should uh, we should make a start so that um, we don't keep people on Zoom for too long. If people are still making their way in, uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, I uh, want to welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's webinar, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America. Uh, my name is Adam Holmes and I'm the Assistant Director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center. This uh, webinar is being uh, presented um, in a, it were co-presented by the Du Bois Center and by the Science and Engineering Library at UMass Amherst. And uh, the webinar is in conjunction with the exhibit uh, currently um, being displayed at, um, at the Science and Engineering Library, which is called Visual Storytelling, How We Use Data and Images to Tell Important Stories About the World Around Us. Um, it's on display throughout this spring, and I'm going to hand over briefly to my colleague, Rebecca, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the show before we hear from our speakers. Thanks, Adam. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca resnick Allen. I'm the head of the Science and Engineering Library. Um, in our branch, we typically install a new exhibit of artwork or information each semester of the academic year. This year, despite challenges, we continued this trend and installed our exhibit on visual storytelling, how we use data and images to tell important stories about the world around us. Data in its natural state can be difficult to interpret, but when it is visually represented, presented and presented in a way that facilitates understanding, it can be incredibly powerful. So this exhibit is a small homage to that skill of presenting data to tell important stories. It includes four stories that visualize data in beautiful and compelling ways and offers two primers on design, design fundamentals and managing data so that you can tell stories with your data. And we are so happy to be able to include a selection of the W.E.B. Du Bois infographics as the anchor for this exhibit. They were in fact part of the inspiration for this when last year several of the science librarians attended event in the, in the Du Bois Center and were introduced to them. So we're very, very happy to be partnering with the Du Bois Center on this. So the exhibit is available physically in person to those who make study appointments when the libraries are open to study appointments, not yet, hopefully soon. Um, but we do also have a virtual component and I am gonna share the link with you all later so that you all can take a look at those stories. So I'm very much looking forward to the rest of this program. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Rebecca. And um, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, we're gonna hand over in a minute, in a minute to our speakers and um, uh, the chat will remain closed during the actual discussion component so that we can uh, keep the conversation free flowing, but then we're going to throw it open uh, towards the end of the event uh, for questions um, from the audience. We'll also encourage you to drop questions into the Q&A window. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, so I'll let me first introduce um, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste, who is Professor of Anthropology at, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, she holds an MA in History from the College of William and Mary and a PhD in Anthropology from the University of Texas, Austin. Her research focuses um, on the intersection of race, gender, class, and sexuality, and her work has included interpreting captive African domestic spaces at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage Plantation in Nashville, Tennessee, um, school segregation in 19th century Boston, um, the Miller's Plantation site in the Bahamas and the Burkhart family homestead, also known as the W.E.B. Du Bois homestead in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Whitney is also the director of the Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst, which was established to engage audiences in discussion and scholarship about global issues involving race, labor, and social injustice. Whitney is both a scholar and an activist who has directed community archaeology projects and sees the classroom as a place to engage contemporary issues with a sensibility of past. Her publications include Black Feminist Archaeology and W.E.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits Visualizing Black America, co-edited with Brett Russett, who is Associate Professor in the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's the author of Fugitive Science, Empiricism and Freedom in Early African-American Culture, and co-editor with Whitney Battle Baptiste of the aforementioned Du Bois's Data Portraits, a collection of the visual graphics Du Bois and his students at Atlanta University prepared for the 1900 Paris Exposition. Fugitive Science received sole finalist mention for the Laura Romero First Book Prize from the American Studies Association, as well as an honorable mention for the MLA's prize for a first book. Her manuscript in progress, the African-American Picture Gallery, 
Imagining Black Art circa 1859 has been supported by an ACLS fellowship and a National Endowment for the Humanities summer stipend. Thank you both for agreeing to speak to us today about this fascinating subject. And I'm gonna ask Whitney to, um, to start us off um, by just providing a very, I know a lot of our audience will be familiar with Du Bois and uh, his amazing career, but just um, tell us where Du Bois is uh, in his life and career uh, in 1900 as he embarks on this project. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and thank you for the um, engineering library and the exhibit. We really appreciate data everywhere it appears because data, Ah, data is important in our lives. And thank you, Britt. And Britt and I have um, done this a lot. So we, uh, we work well together, um, clearly, because we have a book. But I wanted to give you a little bit of contextualization. As an archaeologist, I'm all about understanding the context, right? So where was Du Bois when the 1900 exhibit came, came to be? And what was he doing? And why was he able to collect so, so much information about African-Americans at the time? And um, Britt and I will both be, be showing you images. I realized that the image that I was gonna show of Du Bois um, is really post this time period. So just use your imagination as him as younger, okay? So he um, is finished with Harvard. He, um, He's very old here. We'll just go to Nina. Okay, so um, he is he is um, a young and relatively newly married um, academic, and um, he has finished at Harvard. And I think, in for the most part, he was expecting to be able to secure a position, an academic position. Um, and he first went to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, he did a call to do a scientific study of the uh, African-Americans in Philadelphia. So although uh, for many sociologists, not all, for many sociologists, sociology began at the University of Chicago, um, um, Du Boisian scholars such as Alden Morris, who is the author of A Scholar Denied, would make the really legitimate claim that Du Bois's methods and what he did starting with the 1900 expedition, actually starting with the Philadelphia Negro, which is, was his uh, first publication, um, was in many ways setting up a template for the, the, the kind of scientific methods used by sociologists from this point forward. I, I like to always show a picture of, and her name is pronounced Nina, N-I-N-A, Du, uh, Gomer Du Bois, because she's so rarely a part of, of the story of Du Bois. But she was there living with him in Philadelphia as in a very small apartment in the heart of, of the area where he was um, conducting interviews <clears throat> with people and really looking at, forgive the, the blurry slide, use your imagination. Um, the Philadelphia Negro was really to, to create a way to understand what life was through occupation, through whether people were renting, whether people owned, um, what, what, um, how many people were living in the house, what were their marital status. These were a lot of the kinds of questions that Du Bois was asking. Um, and some of these questions were a little bit intrusive, but very much a part of um, the, the the bulk of what Du Bois was doing in terms of trying to create um, the first scientific study of African-American life in an urban center, which was Philadelphia, and that was uh, the Philadelphia Negro. Um, just to let you know, he was not able to secure a, um, a position at, U at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he he says, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm ad-libbing his quote, but the quote was basically the only time where he was in the presence of other academics at UPenn is when all of them, and he referred to them as stuffy, stodgy kind of men, came down to take a tour of where he was researching. That was the only time he had any connection with University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so much like Harvard, we celebrate him being the first black PhD to, uh, at Harvard, 
But Du Bois in his own words says, he went to Harvard, he was never of Harvard. So we have to remember that although Du Bois is um, extremely eloquent way of talking about in many ways that systemic racism that was in the academy that he pointed out that was obvious to him at Harvard as well as University of Pennsylvania. So um, initially, and he, he actually, this was not his first position. His first position was at Wilberforce in Ohio, which was, which is a historically black institution. And that's actually where he met Nina Gomer Du Bois and they married quickly and moved to Philadelphia. After that, he secured a position at another historically black institution that was Atlanta University, which is now in Atlanta still and known as Clark Atlanta. And um, what, when the, the pieces came together, the pieces were for him to actually also reach out to other scholars at historically black colleges to find images of the kinds of education and the kinds of um, um, opportunities that African Americans that were attending these institutions were able that that they were learning all kinds of of um, from banking to accounting to um, seamstressing to um, the sciences. And these were all provided um, in a historically black setting, which was also the humanities were strong. So students learned Latin, they learned about Greek mythology, they learned about all of the, the kinds of trends that were happening in that time in, the, in, in this country. So I just wanted to kind of set up as he gets to Atlanta, um, pretty soon after that, the 1900 exposition becomes um, something that he is approached about. And I'm not, Britt, do you wanna take it? Or. Yeah, I mean, that's that's super helpful, I guess. And um, before we hear Adam's next question, I, I just really love that framing in terms of like Du Bois' nominal inclusion in these elite institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's really important and also help, helps us understand his motivation moving south to Atlanta University, because when you read his, his um, accounts of his time in Philadelphia, he just talks over and over again about his isolation there, about how, you know, um, he, he talks about how this is a study that he conducted all on his own. And it was clearly like a wake up call for him in terms of his relationship to educate or institutions of higher learning. And so I also like to think about his, his kind of move from Philadelphia to Atlanta University as a, being about an opportunity to expand his sociological studies of black life um, in turn of the century, in the turn of the century United States, and also an opportunity for him to work with a team of not just researchers, but black researchers. Um, I think that those two things were really central in driving him um, to move to Atlanta University and to kind of, you know, broaden the scope of his, his sociolog sociological studies, but also fighting the kind of isolation that he had experienced at these PWIs earlier. Right. And um... So, so Britt, I'll actually bring us, I have a couple of more slides to bring us to 1900. Okay, I just wanted to, wanted to open it up because, you know, it's a, it's a team effort. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I kind of bring up a couple of major events that happened in his life. So this is actually, I, I'm sorry, but I, I went back in time a little bit. If you see my cursor, um, this right here is Nina Du Bois. This is at Wilberforce. Um, I, has, I said historically black college. Yes, these are the staff. Um, and here is Du Bois all the way over here. Um, and so this is a pretty um, important moment. In 1899, two major things happened in Du Bois' life that also I would argue really kind of not only became the foundation, but began to build from the foundation of his moving from understanding that uh, data was not going to create equality alone, right? It was going to be data plus the realities of life for African-Americans in uh, uh, an, a country where Jim Crow was still extremely um, prevalent and active. So in 1899, the uh, murder of Sam Hose was in Atlanta, was one of the major catalysts for him. Um, but also it was the death in the same year 
about a month or so apart in 1899, where he, his 18 month son uh, pictured here in the middle, Burkhard Du Bois um, passed away. And um, many would say he would have lived if it, if it was, if the hospitals and doctors did not have segregated um, policies where he could not get help because he was a Negro child. And um, because of that, he, he passed away. So this is, there's a lot. So I, when I talk about context, there's a lot going on in Du Bois's life at the same time as the idea for the 1900 exposition and the American Negro ex, um, exhibit um, becomes something that is, so it's for me, it's not only a testament to the expansion of his work in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Negro. But for him, it's also a call to the world to recognize the humanity of African-Americans because we're talking 1899, 1900, slavery for all its legal sense is over in 1865. So we're not talking a huge many generations later, we're talking about right out of slavery, he wanted to demonstrate the kinds of gains that African-Americans had had. And especially in the South, like Atlanta and in Georgia, he wanted to bring attention to the fact that African-Americans were property owners, business owners, they were, um, they were, they owned homes, they, there were families, there were all kinds of activities happening in the same South where Jim Crow was alive, but African Americans were still continuing after, well, post emancipation to be successful. So I just wanted to kind of end with that context, the, the end of that context into 1900 when he um, starts to get a, a lot more busy. Thanks, Whitney. Um, Britt, could you tell us a bit about the um, the Exposition Universelle, pardon my pronunciation, and how what, what the what these um, events were all about, and how the American Negro exhibit comes together, and, and Du Bois's uh, initial involvement. Yeah, so the Paris Exposition is part of these world fairs that were emerging in the late nineteenth century um, to kind of mark the beginning of the new century to show off industrial prowess across you know so-called first world countries um, and really to um, articulate a kind of um, uh, kind of I guess a kind of uh, kind of competition among like leading nations that often included um, a, a pretty um, intense display of imperial power and the construction of hierarchies um, that are rooted in slavery and imperialism. Um, so uh, there was, you know, a lot of um, evolutionary and eugenicist logic at display on these uh, at these fairs. Um, we know that there were, um, you know, African villages, villages of indigenous peoples that were um, you know, on display in these spaces um, that were sort of like juxtaposed with these exhibits of um, Western and European modernity and industrial progress. Um, so it was sort of a social, in many ways, these fairs were sort of like a social, a, a visualized display of social Darwinism. That's often how I think about the kind of structural logic of these world's fairs. Um, and so that's why, it, you know, it's in significant and so important that African Americans um, agitated for involvement and um, to have their own contribution within the fair space in order to counter that kind of narrative. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would say there's this interesting question about the Paris Exposition about um, fair goers and this question of audience, Adam, that you asked. And I can't remember now if you just asked about it, but in your original list of questions you asked about audience, you know, I um, just wanted to kind of point out for folks here, if you go to the Library of Congress where you can see all of these Du Bois infographics um, digitized there as well as in our book, um, there's also a whole set of films from the Paris Exposition, which I, I, we, I hadn't seen while we were putting the book together, but now looking at them, they just really give you a kind of like 
feeling for what it must have been like to be at the fair. There's some really amazing footage of this moving promenade um, where, you know, you also see there's the, the kind of novelty of, of the camera. And so you see people kind of like hamming up, hamming it up in front of the camera, jumping in and out of shots, children kind of walking up, approaching the camera and all of the, on this kind of moving promenade. And I will say, um, since for this book, we were really focused on black participation at the, at the exposition and we're interested in knowing um, if people of color and who who attended and would have seen this exposition, I mean, we know that um, Thomas Calloway, who organized the exhibit, was there, and Du Bois puts together all of this money and kind of scrambles to get funds in order to secure his passage to Paris, um, in order to put the exhibit on display. Um, and I don't think until I watched these these short films on the Library of Congress page that I really. Um, realized what a white space it was. I mean, when you watch these films, it's, in, you know, it was also a place where people were, Whitney talks a lot about this in terms of like conspicuous consumption and consumption practices during this period. I mean, people are in their Sunday best, they're in their bustles and their top hats. And so, I mean, this was like a whole production going to the fair. And it, I would, if you're interested in knowing more about like the context of what these fairs not only sort of like what they were up to in terms of the narrative they were attempting to produce, but like what it might have felt like to be there. Um, I would encourage you to look up those films. It really gave me a sense of like, it would have been striking to see Du Bois as a black man, as an African American man in that space, um, within, the, within the space of the American Negro exhibit, but just even walking the fairgrounds. Um, so I hope that helps to, to provide some context. Um, should I just show maybe two images? of the um, American Negro exhibit itself. And Adam, if it's helpful, I'm um, happy to talk a little bit too about like how Du Bois gets to the, the Paris exposition and the conditions of that. So this is Du Bois in Paris. This is his, you know, after his trip to, to Germany where he studies at the University of Berlin, this is sort of his second major international trip. And you can see, you know, the top hat, a certain kind of stylization, I think also, this for Du Bois is a moment where he's really um, first for the first time cultivating him as a certain kind of cosmopolitan intellectual. So I think the infographics are also important in terms of how we think about the kind of cosmopolitan and transnational dimensions of his work and activism. And then here's a picture of the American Negro exhibit itself. So you can see that the Du Bois infographics were prominently displayed. You can see them mounted on the wall there. And I'd like to show it because you can see that the, the you know, our, our book really kind of focuses on the image and I think tries to curate and, and wants everyone to kind of focus on this artistic dimension of the exhibit. But you can see here that there were many other contributions to the American Negro exhibit. Um, would it be helpful for me to say something about um, the organizer and the kind of context or how Du Bois gets here? Um, yes, I think so. Just sort of, just to see, you know, does uh, Callaway you know, bring Du Bois in and, um, and uh, you know, how does that uh, initial negotiation um, take place? And, um, uh, and then perhaps after that, uh, Whitney, you could uh, speak a little bit about the actual data collection itself and where, um, you know, once Du Bois has agreed to take part, where he goes uh, to gather this data, what he's uh, motivated by and who he's working with. So the organizer of the American Negro exhibit is Thomas Calloway. He was a DC area activist, educator, and um, editor of The Colored American. Um, he had been undergrad buddies with Du Bois at Fisk. So um, one thing to say here is that like sort of like intimate black networks among men, but increasingly also among um, women are crucial in terms of how we think about this exhibit, I think. So they, they had this personal connection. Um, Callaway agitates for um, inclusion of African Americans in, you know, into the US's contribution um, in exhibits to the Paris Exposition. And he has Booker, T's, Booker T. Washington's ear. Washington's got the hookup in DC. And so it's Washington who basically makes this happen. Um, so, um, the, the, so Callaway receives grant funding um, and he ends up, you know, I think we can think about the exhibit in sort of broad terms as um, about displaying, as Whitney already mentioned, um, African-American progress since emancipation. And there's that kind of broader narrative. It also in a kind of more concrete sense intended to show off 
um, the skills and also the contributions of Black students at historically Black um, colleges across the South. So there's contributions of students from Fisk, um, Hampton, Atlanta University. Um, and so Du Bois, so basically Callaway calls up Du Bois, asks him to be involved. Um, and I think for Du Bois, it was like a really important um, opportunity for him to showcase the work that he had just started to be just started at Atlanta University. It gave him some grant funding to continue these really kind of like deep locally cited sociological studies that he had started in Philadelphia. He had also received some um, grant funding from the state to conduct um, a study in Virginia. And so, you know, it, it made it made sense for there also to be this 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 study on um, the, G, the Georgia Negro. Um, I do think, you know, one thing to say is is many of the other contributions to the exhibit. If you look at these frames, these kind of movable frames, there's agricultural tools in there. Um, a lot of the other exhibits were really invested in kind of showing the kind of Washington model of racial uplift and a focus on um, agricultural expertise and bl Black contributions in the South. And I think Du Bois's contribution and his team's con contribution is really attempting to show like kind of the more intellectual sides of, um, of Black life and education um, during this period. And I think that's part of the reason why we get this really proto-modernist image. Um, there's something that's, there's something, there's a kind of like almost like um, stylistic excess to the images, I think. I think that Du Bois is sort of like, you know, the Washington model in some ways looks back to slavery and looks back to agriculture. And Du Bois was like looking, you know, looking to the machine age, looking to the 20th century. And I think was not, I wouldn't say he was upsetting the narrative of the American Negro exhibit, but was trying to show a kind of different side to it. And he does that with those kind of like bright images with the visual economy of the images. Um, and with this kind of like visual style, you know, that looks like mid-century modernist art, basically. So, um, Whitney, could you tell us a little bit about how and where and with whom and uh, Du Bois collects this data and, and, and what the sort of focus is, um, you know, what, what is he choosing to, um, to show us uh, in these, uh, you know, through this data? And you'll uh, have to unmute, I'm afraid. Love the mute, okay. Um, so I think that, yeah, there's a lot of um, contributions. So um, I want to share again um, this uh, picture of Du Bois um, as, like, I'm still, I'm pretty sure that this is Atlanta University, that's how it was described, but I'm not 100% sure that it's not the crisis, but I am pretty sure that this is from Atlanta University. Um, I have to do a little bit more research because you have to be careful with um, Wi-Fi edits, I believe, um, or Wi-Fi acknowledgements. So I wanna say that the, the actual information that comes up, not, not necessarily the pictures of students in classrooms and, and learning all of the, uh, you know, a plethora of, of arts and, and um, technical skills, et cetera, that, that, were, that um, students at historically black colleges were learning, but along the lines of the fact that he had men and women who were collecting data that became um, this Atlanta School of Sociology. And I think that, so the, the kinds of um, images that, uh, that I have, this, hmm, sorry, technology. Um, um, the, The one thing that I do want to uh, bring up is the fact that understanding the kinds of data that he is collecting has a, a, a wider arch, right? So he's really not just talking about what's happening in, in the US right now among African-Americans, but he's also in many ways looking at kind of the beginnings of the African presence in the Americas. So he actually 
for him, and as, as Britt is saying, there's a, there's a wider range that he is trying to acknowledge through these amazing stylized images that are not as prevalent with, again, as Britt is saying, with the Booker T model of agriculture and looking back. So he, the, his sense of looking back is about the diaspora, right? So, and the reason why Britt and I also really love this image is because at the very bottom, we both believe that this is the first time when he is using the phrase, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. So I, I bring this particular, and this is one of um, also Mabel O. Wilson's favorites too, uh, images as well, who was a contributor to our book. But if, the, if you understand, again, context for me, right? Even though he's talking about the diaspora, right? The spreading of Africans throughout the Americas. If you look where my little cursor is right here to the key, he's still, he's still contextualizing Georgia, right? In comparison of, of, of where else. And, and he's looking at, and the shading of, of dark means um, the larger amounts of Africans that end up being in these particular places and the South Southern United States. And as you can see, the Caribbean and Brazil happen to be where the most are, are, are coming from. So it is, it is a lot of th these kinds of details that also add to the kinds of information that he's providing on a, to a global audience. Um, and, and as Britt is saying, to a majority European white audience, that's not necessarily um, um, that is not necessarily accustomed to learning about these kinds of um, these kinds of images. And so I just and I also want to show this. This is very blurry, but as you can see, infographics here right all along here but and this is this is our dr du bois but i just want you to see the juxtaposition of booker t washington here to the left and the great emancipator who is abraham lincoln and that always struck me also and i know i'm not answering adam's question that always struck me as <laughs> something that really kind of talks to you about the cut that what is going on here there are pictures all of these right here are books that are written from the hands of African Americans. And that these kinds of, these kinds of, these for me artifacts really point to, to Du Bois pushing that intellectual, despite the great emancipator and the great Washington, I don't know what to call them, the great industrialist, uh, no, agriculturalist, and how these kinds of images through all of those two great men, right? Or, or you know, men that are being acknowledged at the, you know, here is the, <laughs> the American Negro exhibit and these two men flanking each side. But beneath that, which is at technically I view are the, the infographics. They are the thing to catch your eye, but also it becomes a way to communicate the kind of research that these black men and women at Atlanta University were conducting in a way that is colorful, in a way that is engaging, but also actually moves beyond language because you can kind of look and the, they're pictures. They are speaking pictures that uh, some of them are in with French language and some of them are in English, but what it is is hopefully being able to catch your eye with color, but also the movement of the pieces themselves really creates a, a space for people to stay at the exhibit. Um, and that is, there's another, um, sorry, there was one. And this is the um, image of the, 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 Isle, the Isle of Palace. Um, and right here, so as soon as you walk into the door, here is the United, the United, sorry. Here is the American Negro exhibit. So you have um, a lot of other things going on in this room, but I would argue that these 
images that are along the wall at eye level really brings you in, especially with all of these artifacts that are around like books and pictures and all of these things. So I think that it was strate very strategically placed, which was surprising, but it was also, it took up a fourth of the entire building. And I think that um, that is important to understand because of the placement in, um, in, uh, you know, like, because here you have the, I'm sorry, my eyes are not doing well right now, um, models of tenement houses in the center of the, of the building. Um, and over across um, the way is industries and resources of country. So it's really interesting that resources and industry are directly uh, you know, adjacent to the United, the, the American Negro exhibit. Um, and there, because I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I could answer it. I think it's, I don't have a, um, I don't know if I have a, like a lengthy response, but I will just say we know we you know we need basically anyone in the in the in the Zoom room who wants to do follow up and research. We need to know more about the researchers and like you know I think looking at the Atlanta University Bulletin would be a good place to start. I know Lauren Klein and her team at Emory is doing some research on the history of data visualization and is 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 thinking about um, conducting interviews with descendants of Atlanta U um, alumni to like learn more about people who potentially did data collection on the project. So this the data collection we know would have been Du Bois's team of students and researchers at Atlanta University. Um, and I also think that he was um, drawing on networks of graduate Atlanta University graduates across the South, you know, Atlanta U, Atlanta University and other black colleges at this time were doing a lot of teacher training, basically, of people who would get their degrees in sociology, specialized degrees and would would become teachers and, you know, more rural areas or across the South. And so I think in terms of this question of like data collection, we need, to, there's a lot more we need to learn. Um, I think a place would to start would be with like those graduates and students of Du Bois. Um, looking at the records of the Atlanta University conferences, which were being organized and led by Du Bois during these years would be another place to look. Um, and again, I think there's actually, I think, you know, there's also just like a distributed network of research and researchers going on. I think that's sort of fundamental for understanding this. And I also think that Black women um, were involved with the data collection and interviews for this study, and I think we need to know more about them. So those aren't those are those those aren't answers. It's just more to say that those are that's sort of our hypotheses, and that's the terrain for understanding the data collection. And I think we need and want to know more about the um, about the students and researchers who are involved with the study. I mean, this is part of the thing with when you do research on Du Bois is his name is huge. And so I, I you know, my first book was called Fugitive Science. And I was really interested in like, thinking about networks of black knowledge production in the 19th century. And what one of the things that initially drew me to these images um, was I was trying to think about it as a sort of like extension of fugitive science into these late 19th century, early 20th century contexts. And I like to, I'm really interested in terms of fugitive science, um, how these images are kind of like represent a distributed network of knowledge production, of black knowledge production. Um, and so Du Bois, it, you know, Du Bois, calling them the Du Bois infographics illuminates a certain set of things, but it also obscures a whole set of kind of intellectual networks, including the intellectual um, contributions of black women that, you know, that interest both both myself and Whitney. Adam, if we have time for it, Whitney, would you mind showing that that image um, that you showed from the from the Pan American Exposition in 1901? Is that OK, Adam? Yeah, it's OK with me. I guys. Really I mean, <laughs> I'm I mean, you're running the show. You can say no. I'm not going to leave any time. Go ahead. You know. <laughs> so I, I really, I love this image. Um, if I remember correctly, this is this is from um, a piece of ephemera from the Pan American Exposition. Um, and so this sort of gets to the question of the afterlives of the exhibit. Um, the American Negro exhibit receives a medal from uh, receives a medal at at the Paris Exposition. The Du Bois infographics re receive their own gold medal, and they kind of you know the exhibit comes back to the United States award winning. And that inter international prestige for this black exhibit, I think, really matters. 
Um, and so there's sort of a second round of this exhibit at um, uh, the World's Fair in Charleston, in Buffalo. And, and so there's this kind of like second tour that happens domestically after, after its international exhibit in Paris. Um, I just, I just love this. I love this image for a really selfish reason, which is that I grew up outside of Buffalo, New York, and the Pan American ex exhibition um, exposition happened in 1901 um, uh, on near the grounds of the Albright Knox Gallery, art gallery, which was the art gallery that I grew up going to. It was like a very special place that I got to go to with my mom and with my sister. And it, they have an incredible collection of modern art. Um, and when I we started doing this project, when I learned that the Du Bois infographics had been had had been exhibited in such close proximity to that gallery and in, in this space that was that was really important for me, it really um, it just really it just really struck me and it, there's that kind of personal connection that's special for me and I I just think it's really interesting that these these kind of like proto-modernist images look like pieces of art that I remember seeing at the Albright Knox when I was a kid um, so just to place Du Bois within the a kind of genealogy of modern art in the United States I think is really interesting and important um, and I guess I just also, before we move on from this image, just wanted to point out that Black club women were also fundamental to the further circulation of these images. So the Phyllis Wheatley Club in Buffalo, New York, was responsible for um, getting the American Negro exhibit um, um, to the Pan American Exposition in, in, in Buffalo. And so again, I just, I think sometimes with, with, you know, when we see these images of black men, sometimes the women who were, who were actually <laughs> doing the fundraising or on the ground, putting this stuff together sort of fade from view. So I guess I just wanted to kind of make their, um, their contributions sort of visible for us today. Yeah, and thank you, because I didn't know that the, that the Buffalo women actually brought this exhibit because I, no offense, but I've always wondered why Buffalo. I just... <laughs> I mean, they had a real okay. We can talk more about that, but the black community in Buffalo at the turn of the century was super vibrant. You know, it was a an important place. You know, that kind of like abolitionist history kind of really expanded to the turn of the century. So there's a really kind of rich, rich, rich history there that we don't think about. Okay. Yeah. Oh well, that, I mean that's that's actually leading on to some of the things that I was going to ask you guys about. So that's that's really helpful. Um, I did want to sort of insert a brief question, which it may not be answerable, given that we we, we may not know the answer. Is that um, I'm curious about the aesthetic decisions behind these, um, you know, these visual, you know, the visualization component of the data, because you know we're talking about the connection to uh, modernist art, and obviously this is what's going on and what's about to start going on in France with with cubism and so on you know it, it's it's not I don't think too fanciful to imagine that certain uh, well-known figures would have perused these uh, visualizations but I, I don't know if there's anything you can tell us about the people behind the aesthetic uh, you know the, the decision to present them this way uh, and if not we can just sort of breeze swiftly by that and leave it for uh, the, the next the next uh, the next book um, I do have a question. I do have, Whitney, unless you want to take it, I do have some thoughts. I've been thinking about this recently. Oh, go ahead. So, you know, there's been great work about how all of the anthropological artifacts at these world's fairs, like actually contributed to the development of primitivism in, in modernism in European, you know, in, in American avant-garde movements into the twenties and the thirties, kind of into the mid century, but there's been less work on like, I think the role of data visualization at these fairs in terms of the um, influence on modernism. And so, you know, these images are singular and exceptional and I don't at all want to, this is not downplaying their significance. I do think there is a 19th century genealogy for these images. So I've recently, you know, been looking at the connection between Du Bois and the American settlement movement. So Jane Addams and Hull House, if you look at the Hull House papers, if you look at these kinds of the kind of social reform work and demography that's happening with like Charles Booth in London, there are there is a precedent for these kinds of like very modern looking maps and mapping happening in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. So 
you know, again, I don't know if I, maybe this is a weird thing to do, but I keep like, hey, someone else work on this. But I really would like to know more about like other data visualizations and infographics at the Paris Exposition to see like how Du Bois's images might compare, look different, to see how similar they look. But I just have to believe that some of those would be modernists saw th these forms of data visualization that were coming from, right, like African Americans, um, social reformers, feminist geographers in the 19th century. I think there is actually a clear genealogy. Um, and that if we had a better sense of that history, these images um, wouldn't feel like, I mean, they are, they're kind of surprising, right? When I first learned that they were produced in 1900, I was just blown away. It just, you know, and I'm a 19th centuryist. I really didn't expect it. Um, so I think there, I think there is a genealogy there, but we, we do need to learn more about it. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's such a big question because it, it, the, the details and, and, and understand that part of Du Bois's big, like his, major being a major part of this exhibit is let's face it is also a reflection of Du Bois's ego I mean he he would not have his name on exhibit an exhibit if he was not kind of front and center in that and that is not to take away from the kinds of opportunities that I would argue that he really provided for the students that were under his training at Atlanta University. And I feel that a lot of, so it's not to kind of downplay the fact that there were so many hands involved with the creation of not only the collection of data, but the, the coloring in of these images. I think Britt and I both agree, neither one of us can really see Du Bois coloring these in. Um, and so um, <laughs> it's just not something, it's, it's something that a graduate assistant, if not, you know, assistant would help you to do. And, and that's kind of the, the beauty of, of, of involving Du Bois in any, or any study of Du Bois's work is because as you can tell, it opens up so many other questions that note not just relating to Du Bois, but relating to the field of sociology, relating to Black sociologists in the South and how they functioned after, like, you know, in the 20th, uh, in the 20s and the 30s. And there's a lot of um, potential for including what was, what, what were, who created the exact questions to ask? Was that all Du Bois or was it, you know, as Alden Morris, you know, uh, kind of really maps out in, in A Scholar Denied that he really looks at the other, not just student that were helping him, but also the other professors at Atlanta University that were a part of the larger school of sociology. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Adam, if we have time, maybe for questions, I would love to hear people's thoughts. I guess I will say just to add to that, the images, some of the images are so finished and, you know, seem, and just a reminder, these are all hand-drawn images, right? Some of them are so polished and so clean. Others really, to me, look like student, pro like student work. You And I just really, in terms of thinking about kind of like networks of Black study and thinking about like forms of alienation from artistic labor, academic labor, it's really interesting when you can like, well, first of all, the closer you look the more hands you see, you know, and that's something I've really enjoyed as I keep looking back at these images to start to realize, wow, a lot of people worked on these images and you can just tell from differences in lettering and coloring styles and coloring seams, but it's, there's an unevenness. And I'm in some ways, I mean, of course the cover has a beautiful polished image, but I'm increasingly becoming interested in the images that are like less finished and appear to be like the kind of work of like a board, perhaps a board student, an alienated researcher. I think there's just more to be done in terms of thinking about the the really fascinating unevenness of composition in the images. So obviously we wanna to get to audience questions and we've already had some great ones and I'm gonna throw up in the chat in a second, but just to quickly, Whitney, could you give us a, a just, you know, we've already heard that the exposition won and uh, awards and, uh, you know, it returned to the US and, and toured here, but just, if you could tell us just a little bit about the ongoing significance of of this work that Du Bois did for the um, for the exhibit, and um, uh, you know, and, and how we should sort of consider it when we view his larger career. 
Yes. Um, I think um, one of the kind of non, it's, it's to me very, very obvious in terms of the power of the data. Um, the image, you know, I have to admit that over time, my favorite images, it, my favorite image changes. Um, but on the cover of the book is the, uh, the um, yes, there you go. <laughs> It looks at the the accumulation of proper or the property within households over time, and just this the little TD line at the very top of that circle is literally about the time of about 1865. And as you can see, the lines begin to get longer and longer, and that is the accumulation of material. In, that, in the black household at that time. And I think for me, the reason, as an archeologist, of course, this is about stuff, right? So I love this image, but it's also, it's also, it's very telling of um, racial disparity because of slavery, right? So we can talk about um, property ownership and how people move from being property to owning property. And it's all of these larger implications, thanks Britt, all of these larger implications to me that have a lasting quality where you have, and, and this is something Britt and I have, have, have experienced probably mostly starting on Twitter, but people who are using contemporary um, issues of everything from wealth disparity to, um, um, employment disparate gaps in employment and income to um, disparities within COVID-19 deaths and things like that. People are using contemporary statistics and issues that we're facing now and using the kind of tenants and the kind of uh, basics that, are, that Du Bois and his team used for these demographics in, for contemporary issues all around issues of disparity and, 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 and systemic racism and the ways in which institutionally we can actually see it visually, not just pie charts, which there are, but not just graphs, but, but, but this artistic way of displaying, the colorful way of displaying progress or the ways in which inequality is still very prevalent in our society. So I think that for me, the, the, the images and, and not just the images, but the way in which Du Bois was trying to not only engage data, but to use data to make a lot more points than all the ways in which we are lacking as the quote unquote Negro race. But for him, it was to point out that progress can be measured by data. And, and so I think that that's why progress or the lack of progress can also be kind of demonstrated in this, in this very unique way to present data um, that I didn't learn about. Like when I saw, so when I first started looking at or, understand, or seeing the data, the infographics, I didn't know that infographics was a whole field. And so it was something that I came across because of reading about Du Bois and reading about the exhibit and reading about his early life. And then that translated to understanding just how beautiful these visual, these in infographics are to people who not only study, but live by data. And, I, um, and that's why the, for me, these images, these infographics are timeless and they can constantly be reworked to include contemporary issues and and um, things that you know I don't know contemporary issues and and um, the words are missing. It's like it's getting late. Contemporary issues. That's all I got. <laughs> well, I think that's given us like a really great, um, fantastic introduction to uh, to to the background and the uh, and the collection of the data the show itself and its significance so I really want to encourage our audience to ask questions how you can ask questions in the chat uh, or in the Q&A the chat is open 
Um, and so I'm just gonna um, launch straight in. A couple of these I think we've already covered in the um, sort of in the narrative of the talk. Um, but, uh, but I think this is really interesting from Bristol, writing that Florence Nightingale played a pioneering role in data visualization. And, um, and there are lots of resources that discuss this. Um, and, um, and one of the, the quotes that she drops in is that um, uh, the only data, the, the only data uh, tools available to Florence Nightingale were pen and paper, and that's all she needed to change the world forever with her data. I really like that. Um, and so, uh, but our first question uh, comes from uh, Phil Sinatier, um, and he says, uh, since Du Bois was such a meticulous collector of books and manuscripts, including, of course, the arrangement of his own archive, I wonder if Whitney or Britt can talk about why the original data portraits remain at the Library of Congress and not in Du Bois's papers at UMass or Fisk. It seems he tried to get them back at one point, but for some reason never received them. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big question in terms of that question of the um, like what happens to the how can you talk about the you know, the significance of the images there, there is a way in which the, their circulation is halted by the Library of Congress. And I think it's a really interesting story. I mean, you know, I don't get grant funding like those in the sciences and social sciences do. But in terms of people who are dependent on you know, um, governmental funding from, you know, um, these kind of big grants. I think the Du Bois infographics are sort of a tale about the both the opportunities and the pitfalls of that kind of funding that, you know, um, state funding and public funding allowed him to um, do the study, to conduct the study, to um, get the images together, to get them exhibited. But since it was a US funded um, you know, grant essentially, all of the materials related to the American Negro exhibit were deposited at the Library of Congress after they finished their sort of second tour in the United States. And this really like, it is the reason why, you know, most of us didn't grow up knowing about these images. And we, we know that Du Bois um, remained interested in them because he writes to Calloway in 1909. Um, I believe, um, say asking asking for them back, and Callaway says that you should write directly to the Library of Congress, um, and hopefully they can help you. So we don't have like further, or at least I haven't found any further correspondence from the Library of Congress or a letter to Du Bois. So it could be possible that Du Bois didn't actually follow up with the library. It could be possible that he followed up and they didn't respond. It could be possible that he followed up and they said no. Um, so again, there's a kind of speculative terrain, more research to be done there, but it, I think it is, it is significant that the images don't go back to under Du Bois's control. We know that he was interested in, um, visual technologies in his classroom. I really like this moment. Eldon Morris talks about this in book, in his book about Du Bois's interest in securing a reflectograph or basically a, um, why am I blanking on what it's called? The kind of uh, overhead projector for a class, right? Um, and so, you know, one of the things I should say in terms of, I'm really loving these contemporary data visualizations that are happening as inspired by the images. I would really love to see more like community programming happening with them and more like the introduction of these images into like black curricula and education, because I think that there is a part of this where Du Bois was interested in the use of the sociological data and the use of these images, you know, for further teaching and possibly for like public work in Atlanta. And that didn't happen because essentially, you know, in terms of this question of the archive, the archive of the images kinds of closes once, once they're deposited at the Library of Congress. Um, uh, our book was really enabled by the public digitization of the images at the Library of Congress. So anyone now, can um, you know go online and see them? Of course, online access is tricky, right? Because it presumes that the a certain kind of computer literacy, access to internet, all of these kinds of things that we're learning in the COVID era, right, is is unequal and is rife with kind of different forms of inequality. Um, and so, yeah, so I, you know, I think this question of of the archive and access is 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 really important. I do kind of like to think about the fact that these images are being recirculated and used today because that letter from Du Bois does suggest 
that he continued to think about the images and was curious what work they might continue to do. And so I, I am really inspired about inspired by the fact that they're kind of taking on a new life today. Yeah, that's um, thank you for that. And um, thank you also for mentioning how they um, can be accessed because we had a question from Paul about that if they're available online, they are available digitally through the Library of Congress. And um, my tip for finding them uh, would be to be patient with the algorithm. You will get there eventually. Um, but it's not as easy to use as Credo at UMass, the digitized Du Bois archive, of course. Um, so um, also, uh, let me see here. And we want to uh, thank Dr. Sinatier for a question. Of course. Always. Um, <laughs> we also have a question from Paulina who asks, how, and this is very interesting, how did Du Bois gain the trust of the community to ask sometimes intrusive questions that fed into his data collection? I, so I, I think about, sometimes I think about his work in Atlanta, uh, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia. Um, and I know it is a historical fiction book, but in, um, Sadia Hartman's last book, Wayward Lives, there's a very interesting chapter about a Du Bois data collector, right? Like, you know it's Du Bois because she says it is, but she, based on documents, um, the fact of who Du Bois was, and, and we have to remember that a post-university of Berlin Du Bois is a very different Du Bois than Du Bois straight from um, Great Barrington. So as Britt was talking about, he you know, begins to have this very cosmeto cosmetologian, cosmopolitan persona about him. And some of the things that he brings back from um, Germany um, are a, a goatee with mustache um, off, always a hat, um, preferably a cane, and usually a pair of uh, gloves. And so if you could imagine even him walking about Atlanta um, with his cane and his, and his um, gloves and his mustache, he, he had a very particular style and a very particular way of engaging the community or, or different individual members. I, I dare to say that I believe that a lot of the data that was collected one-on-one -on -one were his students, um, first of all. Um, second of all, there is also um, the idea that although Du Bois appears very staunch and separate, there's a side to Du Bois that I don't think that we actually understand. We need to not have our 21st century minds and to think about what his look or his persona would have presented in 19 teens or 1920s Atlanta as a professor at, at Atlanta University, he would have been extremely respected, but also in many ways, a part of the community that was a part of Atlanta University, kind of their community. Because if you know the AUC, I'm sorry, the Atlanta collect, I didn't go to school down there, but my husband did. So there's all those schools and where they come together, there is a, a kind of um, a kind of uh, a culture that is in 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 that area of Atlanta University, and also what I want to mention, and this is something that you know one day I'll write about, but is the idea that although he never was without full suit on and and all of that, when I had lengthy Dr. Sinatier and I when we were out in Colorado interviewing his granddaughter. She really, thank you, uh, thank you, Sheena, the AUC, Atlanta University Center, thank you, um, that his granddaughter really spoke about what kind of a great sense of humor Du Bois had and the way in which he made people feel at ease. And that is never the Du Bois that I think about, but I did not know Du Bois as he first started to work at Atlanta University in the early 1900s. So I think that for me, although he appears to be like 
the like the poster child for black respectability politics. I also think that Du Bois had a way about him that people opened up to him. And I and 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 I really believe that only because if you his correspondence, um, although you know, problematic in terms of his relationship with women, but he was a staunch supporter of publishing women, women going to um, college, women making their own decisions in the working world. He was extremely sought out by women's organizations and groups to talk about life as a modern woman. This is not someone who would come to a, a talk about that and really make you feel bad for wanting to be a career woman, right? So I think that there's a lot of sides to Du Bois publicly that we still don't fully understand. And I think that that's why he had access to folks in the community that today we might not think would be open in, uh, to talk to a researcher, but it's also the difference between the Workers' Progress Administration um, interviews of what are called ex-slave narratives, right? When they interviewed, these were white women who would go to, your, to, to the houses of former you know, captive folk and interview them. And then Fisk University had a collection of them, um, the Rawick collection, and there's actually one particular man who had three different interviews, one with a Fisk researcher and two with white WPA workers, completely different story all three times. So what I want to, to emphasize is it is also the ways in which these interviews are a collective experience for the community in which they happen. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we think about Du Bois knocking on people's doors and asking them intrusive questions. This is also a moment of the kind of like beginnings of a certain kind of like biopolitical surveillance and like interviewing of pe like people knew they were being surveilled and were they they un understood like people understood the politics of these kinds of surveys and interviews. And I think that's fascinating to think about like what folks might have said to like someone white who showed up at their door versus Du Bois. I mean, I love in Hartman's book, I put it in the chat Thank when you. she just does this amazing kind of like speculative imagining of what black women in the seventh ward in Philly may have thought when they saw this man who, right. you know, she, she stylizes him as the, as a dandy. Yes. And, you know, I, and I agree that like he, I mean, he, there's a kind of like, he may have been sort of like visually startling, but I think it's like, it's right that it wasn't necessarily that he wasn't, that he was like completely alien or foreign. I think in fact, his stylization, self-stylization as a kind of like dandy may have put him in closer proximity to black women or made him more comfortable. And, you know, I think that's why learning more about Du Bois's relationship to the American settlement movement is really interesting because, you know, he was a lifelong correspondent with Isabel Eaton, whose mm -hmm. study on black domestic labor was appended to the Philadelphia Negro. He was a lifelong correspondent and friend with Jane Addams. So, you know, he, he, he was, I think like thinking about Du Bois in the kind of world of women is, is, is really interesting. And I think that that is absolutely at play here. Thank you. Um, a question from a friend of the Du Bois Center, Reynolds Winslow. Um, he asked um, something we didn't necessarily cover, but what was the attendance uh, like at the exhibit in Paris? And, uh, and also, how was it received and critiqued by the press? So I think, I, I mean, I think it was, I, I have not done like a thorough study of this. So I, I think there's probably, you know, there are historians and experts on these world's fairs that I think would have more to say. I would also really recommend um, Mabel Wilson's book, Negro Building. Okay, once Whitney's talking, I'll go get it and I'll show it because I really like to show books on Zoom. You know, she was one of the contributors to our, um, to our collection and she has a really, it's a great history of Black participation in Black exhibits at, at World's Fairs and, um, and, and, and in terms of museums and these kinds of exhibits. Um, but, you know, I do wonder, so the, the, the American contribution, the American section of the Paris Exposition, right, was all together in this Palace of Social Economy. And this is a part of the, 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 the World's Fair um, that highlighted social work, reform work, the rise of demography, statistics, sociology, that, that's this, that's a, that was a particular part of the, the exposition. But there was all kinds of stuff happening um, at the exposition, including like stuff that was out, things, you know, exhibits that were outside, you know, carnivals, rides, like 
just, you know, a kind of like visual feast. So uh, there's a little part of me that would like to learn more about the attendance um, at these more like scholarly exhibits, because my guess is that they may not have been as heavily attended as some of these other exhibits and probably not as heavily attended as like these like really problematic ethnographic parts of the exhibit as well. Um, so it would be if, you know, I know I'm not really trained to do this kind of work, to, but to know more and to, to like compare the, the audience at those, you know, African villages versus at the American Negro exhibit, I think would, would tell us a lot. Well, thank you for that. Um, we've had a question also from uh, Katie Taylor, who asks, um, do you think that the strategies that were employed for the exhibition, putting the infographics at eye level, the modern visuals and so on, was something that might have translated into Du Bois's editing work? Uh, Katie says, I'm thinking about the art slash illustration and often layout of the crisis and the Brownies book in particular, and how vibrant and modern and concerned with a particular visual culture they seem. That that uh, that's that's not a that's not even just a question. That is such a wonderful. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, the layout, the visual. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. I think I don't even like it's it's these moments where I I really wish that you know Mabel or um, the, the folks we asked to contribute are folks who have really been um, steeped in, in, in not just Du Bois's work, but the, the, uh, the work of exhibits and, and Negro exhibits and, and the connection between the museum and the Black, Black people visiting to see themselves reflected is, is a huge part of, of like the, you know, the idea of these these mobile museums that were also going around in this, uh, you know, in the South. Um, so I just think about the ways in which the crisis, and for maybe much younger people, um, remembering having Ebony or Essence or Jet magazine on your, you know, coffee table as something that was it. It was in many ways and kind of an aesthetic um, um, prompt to your kind of membership within a certain class, right? Of of people who uh, subscribed, paid for, and received the crisis every month, or you know when it came out, and and also the brownies book, just the ways in which things are arranged. Um, so I don't want to talk to the visual aesthetics of that, but I think that that's one of the most incredible questions that I've heard because it is, like I said, visually stunning, but also the the ways in and and I and I was argue the same thing about contemporary um, magazines that are focused on black audiences and the kinds of and this has been critiqued and praised in both ways about what are the advertisements right what how are things placed on the cover? What are, you know, all of these kinds of um, ways to speak to not just the audience, but the ways in which the crisis or the Brownies book is actually cluing you in as what is going on in the culture, right? What is going on among Black America? This is for you to know in your latest crisis magazine. So I think that, um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that question, except that I just, I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. And I would also add, you know, it, we tend to date the Harlem Renaissance or you know, the so-called New Negro Renaissance of the 1920s. When you look at these images in 1900, it gives us like um, a different genealogy of the New Negro Renaissance that starts in Atlanta rather than in Harlem. And so I think there's a really important through line if we think about like Du Bois's design principles for the crisis taking shape in Atlanta through this design work, you know, rather than in Harlem, I think it just gives us a really exciting, it just, it's just a different kind of history and a way into how we think about like African-American modernism, how we think about the new Negro Renaissance, how we think about the Harlem Renaissance. And, you know, I do think since we're like right at the cusp of the great migration here, it, th these images and this exhibit gives us like, like a kind of, um, like a speculative history of a different of a of a kind of different history of a new Negro Renaissance or like a Southern Renaissance. 
um, that of course flourishes in different ways, but is also in some ways kind of like muted because of the Great Migration and and because of the the Har because of the Renaissance that takes place um, in in Harlem. So you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there in terms of linking the modernity and the modernism of these images up to the Harlem Renaissance as well. Well, thank you. Um... Thank you, everyone, um, for your amazing questions. Um, we have to wrap it up. Um, but uh, before I do, I want you uh, uh, to give a sort of silent but virtual uh, round of applause to our speakers, um, Brett Russett and Whitney Battle Baptiste. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Science and Engineering Library and um, Rebecca for hosting this, uh, this exhibit. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and Rebecca has uh, Put into the chat uh, ways you can access that exhibit virtually. Um, I also want you to encourage uh, encourage you if you haven't already to uh, to buy the book. Um, Britt was good enough to uh, show the merchandise earlier, um, and uh, so it is available where all good books are sold. I have put in the link to the Princeton Architectural Press and not to the dreaded evil corporation that rules all of our lives. Um, I would also encourage you to. Um, Follow the Du Bois Center uh, in any way you want. We're on social media. I'm popping into the chat the link to our website. Uh, we are also uh, looking at, at this moment in time for uh, support of any kind that you can give us as we look to expand the programming that we're able to do, especially once we go back to in-person events um, where we would like to be able to, you know, rent venues, provide catering and so on, and support um, the student community at UMass as well as scholars from across the country and the world. Uh, so any help you can give us would be hugely appreciated. And finally, if you want to be uh, put on a mailing list for events of this type and for our other um, programming, you can email me at this address um, and I'll happily add you to our list and send you all the uh, all the Du Bois Center spam. Um, there's great ways to engage with Du Bois um, actually on a weekly basis because every Monday a group of us gathers first thing um, at 9.30 Eastern to um, to discuss a different piece by Du Bois each week. It's a, it's a really great way to meet other people who are interested in Du Bois and to, you know, weigh in with your own thoughts in a really informal and safe setting. So, um, you know, I encourage all of you to, you know, to stay in touch and to email us and to, uh, to buy the books and go on the website, follow us on social media and just enjoy Du Bois because, um, you know, there's a lot of him and we'd love to bring you these events. So thank you very much uh, for attending this afternoon, which has turned into this evening. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Whitney. And thank you, Rebecca. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Britt and Adam and Rebecca. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>